Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Uh, and to my guests. Hey! What's up? Hey. Hi. And to anybody watching us over the internet. Hola. Um, so this is great. I'm very happy to be here. I know that they're like, stop touching the microphones, but I'm just trying to adjust it. So there we go. Um, it's great to have you all here because, you know, you could be doing anything right now in New York City and you've chosen to be with us here at the Green Space talking about uh, Mexican art and culture um, and kind of how it impacts us as Mexicanos or half Mexicanos who are um, living on this side of the border. Um, and it's great to be here with Ruben Martinez and Veronica Gonzalez Peña. Uh, Veronica was born in Mexico City like I was. Uh, she was raised in Ohio. I was raised in Chicago, yeah. so we got this Midwest. Chilango Midwest thing going on. Um, she's an author, a playwright, and a filmmaker, um, and actually works in multiple and mixing disciplines. Her first novel, Twin Time, or How Death Befell Me, was awarded the Aztlan Literary Prize for Best Novel. Uh, Ruben Martinez is an old buddy of mine. We've known each other way too long. Um, he's a native of Los Angeles and the son and grandson of immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. He's an Emmy award-winning journalist with two decades of experience in print, broadcast, and online media. And he also hosts a show called Variedades, ¿verdad? Yes. That's like the best for those of us who know about like Variedades. So you have singing, dancing. He may even dance fun. for us later. Um, it's great to have the both of you here. Let's give him a round of applause. A New York round of applause. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I guess we should probably just, before we jump in, kind of talk about our own relationship to Mexico so that the audience who's come here and interested in all things Mexico um, as part of Penn. So I was born in Mexico City in La Colonia Narvarte. I was um, raised in Chicago, but as I was telling Veronica backstage, um, I was going back to Mexico every year. Every year we would go back, and I just went back now, and I have toda mi familia, except for my immediate brothers, brother and sister, um, and my husband and children. Everybody's in Mexico. Um, so it's very much a part of a real experience for me, mm -hmm. and at the same time also this very kind of um, nostalgic uh, recuerdo de un Mexico that is gone. Yeah. Um, but of course, then also in New York City, that has become a Mexican city. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. What about you? What's your relationship? Well, I was born in Mexico, and um, I left Mexico when I was six years old. And it was not. It was not. Uh, it was not a, a my family leaving with me. I was adopted out uh, to my uncle, and my mother's uh, mentally ill. So the way that I left Mexico was. Uh, fairly violent, uh, emotionally violent. And so for me, Mexico is a place um, that, because of the way that I left it, has felt like a, an exile, not just an immigrant uh, uh, relationship to um, coming to the United States, but more of an immigrant relationship. I'm, I'm sorry, more of an exile relationship. So there's this great distance and this very internalized relationship to Mexico that you're talking about that's full of nostalgia and longing. And so Mexico for me is this uh, almost a dreamlike place. And when I go back there to the actual Mexico, those two things are kind of merging in this very strange and interesting way. And the way that I'm talking, I think, will convince you that um, I'm a novelist. And this is how I think <laughs> layers of, of information all the time. It gets Exhausting. Uh, yeah, it gets a little bit exhausting, unless you're reading the books. Ruben. A uh, very complicated relationship with Mexico. I grew up in uh, the second largest Mexican city, which is Los Angeles, California. Right. Um, uh, like, and uh, which is, you know, I, I, it's a kind of a joke, but it's, it's, it's true. Um, it's uh, like a, a, a far outpost, the furthest suburb of Mexico City. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I grew up with a Salvadoran mother and a Mexican father, uh, regaled with stories of crossing the border back and forth. My Mexican grandparents who were cancioneros mexicanos from the post-revolutionary era. Um, and I have to say, a big part of my relationship to Mexico when I was young was uh, an imagined Mexico, an Im imaginary Mexico seen through American gringo eyes. Because my grandparents as musicians, as folk musicians, their uh, bread and butter jobs were playing for the tourists, playing for Gringos on Alvera Street, which is our little like Mexican mm -hmm. village in the center of Los Angeles. Um, and so they had to ham it up. 
You know, they had to play like the Speedy Gonzalez, arriba, arriba, andale, andale, you know, kind of Mexico. And so that, w and I saw that on TV as well in the Westerns that my dad kind of grew up on. So I have relationships to an actual Mexico that I live and work in as an adult, as a journalist, you know, over many years, and especially today in its time of crisis. But then there's this childhood in Mexico, which is kind of strange and weird and funny and racistly represented. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. So, um, how often, I mean, you were, we were talking, Veronica, about the work that you do in, in terms of your writing and your filmmaking, where Mexico, even though we've been gone a long time yeah. from the city that we yeah. were born in, still makes its way into your work. Why do you think that, and you were like, it's a space that you live in. Why do you, I mean, Mexico, I, having just gotten back from Mexico City, yeah. And for those of you who know Mexico City, I stayed overlooking El Zócalo right in downtown because I wanted to have that experience, which I don't think is, I mean, it's like the most Mexico City experience that you could possibly have is to wake up in El Zócalo. And it was because I was like, I need, I need to breathe Mexico City, I need it. Um, and, and we have that, and you obviously yeah. have that. Yeah. How do you kind of process that? Because we, you could also just say, yeah, uh, I'm turning. I'm turning to someplace else. I I hold it so uh, I think so deeply inside myself. Um, at, at I can make it conscious, but it's also so deeply um, in me that it's not until I'm in Mexico that I realize how deep my relationship is to it. Uh, because I'm affected, as soon as I land, I'm affected by the way that light plays through trees or the air, or I, I walk a lot in Mexico. I walk more there than I walk here. And um, it's almost like, a, it's like this need to walk the city and kind of become part of the city. Um, but, I, but I write about Mexico City a lot. Uh, even though I, I haven't lived there, I visited there, but I haven't lived there since I was a very small child. But it's really my mental landscape, it's my dreamscape, it's, it's, the, um, it's my in, internal, very deep internal reality. So it's what I'm always returning to at some, at some deep level. Yeah. And it, it's a positive space for Oh you? yeah, no, it's an amazing space. I move back and forth, I move a lot. I move back and forth between Los Angeles and New York more than probably you should. Um, and I and I and I kind of am a little bit bicoastal now, which is great. That's a, a good way to deal with it, rather than moving my entire life every few years. Um, but I realized with my therapist, you can probably all tell I see a therapist, um, and she's she or he is not Mexican. No, but, but he, he's kind, able of, to, he kind he, of understands. He gets it. Yeah, he gets it. So I realized that the reason I go back and forth between New York and Los Angeles is because I'm making a Mexico City, the super urban New York, and then. Los Angeles, which is more human scale and full of parks and trees, and the combination of these two places is the Mexico City that I can live in. That just hit me like three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> really? Three yeah, it was like a revelation. So, Ruben, um, you're a, a journalist and a professor, but you're also an activist in the sense, a, a cultural activist. Um, talk about having just been in Mexico City, I think, you know, the thing that the politics of the moment in Mexico City around Ayotzinapa and Los 43, the 43, sure. and just um, how, you know, visually we experience the activism of what's happening in Mexico compared to what we're experiencing on this side. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I talk a lot about, for example, um, we know that undocumented immigrants and immigrants who are here legally are probably having difficult encounters with authority the police, immigration agents, maybe not such good ones. But you're not seeing massive protests coming out for them because these are people who are essentially too afraid to come out and protest, too afraid to be active in that sense. Because if you're undocumented and you're protesting on the street and you get arrested. So how do you kind of see the activism vis-a-vis -vis what you're seeing in LA with you know Latinos compared to what Black Lives Matter, Mexico City. Sure. Uh, so many things come to mind hearing both of you talk about Mexico City. You talked about being in uh, the hotel overlooking uh, the Zócalo. El Hotel Zócalo. Majestic. Majestic, yeah. I, I was there on November 20th, 2014. I chose that hotel because there was a mass mobilization. Uh, for those of you who don't know Mexico City, the Zócalo is the, the 
grand colonial plaza right in the heart of the city. It's a massive plancha, big lava stone, open space. And then there's the, the Presidencia on the one side and, and, and the old cathedral on the other side, and then the ruins of the Aztec uh, uh, people that were there before. So it's, it's a symbolically charged space, and that's where all the big marches end up. And on November 20th, 2014, just a couple of months, uh, two months almost to the day after the, the 43 students disappeared, from uh, the rural school in, um, uh, in Guerrero, there was a, uh, the largest mobilization, uh, and it was on the anniversary of the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. So it was charged with, with, with heavy political symbolism, and I was mingling with the crowd for, for hours, and there was a, people were just arriving and arriving, 200,000 people ultimately filled the Zócalo. And, um, and there was a lot of talk about provocateurs and about double agents and about security. There was a lot of paranoia, even as there was this effusive, festive atmosphere. And it did turn violent. And uh, from 200,000 people being together, affirming life, even in the face of the disappearance of, of, of the students, uh, and affirming the possibility of change and the hope for uh, uh, a Mexico where the state is not part of the machinery of death alongside the narcos, right? Um, the, the plancha was swept clean in about, I'd say, of 200,000 people in about 15 minutes with but, tremendous violence, tremendous violence. Uh, pepper spray and batons and uh, these huge kind of like uh, street sweeper machines. I ran, I got into my room in the Majestic and I have this, the, 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 the cell phone video images and I was just looking at this and looking down below and it just kind of like, that's, that's what the state does in Mexico. That's, that's the violence of the state. Fue el Estado is the, 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 uh, Fue el Estado. the, the slogan of the movement. The state's responsible for, for the violence just as much as organized crime is. And uh, so that's what hope confronts in Mexico today. Did you want to jump in? Middle? Yeah, I wanted to say that the students, what the students were doing is that they were going to go protest the, um, the murders in Tlatelolco, which were, which were state-sanctioned murders in 68. You know, the whole world was afire in 68, including uh, Mexico, Mexico um, and, and that was the outcome. So that's what the, the uh, 43 disappeared students were on their way to Mexico City to protest that. And, and, and a protest does, uh, does get quashed, I think, there in a different way than it does here. Um, I wanted to say one other thing about the central plaza. The Zócalo is a central plaza, and it is where all of these demonstrations end up. It's the second largest uh, central plaza in the world after Tiananmen Square. And that, that type of well, action. I didn't know that. Second largest, yeah. And also, one, one other thing to say is that that, is the, that was the center of the Aztec world. And all of the, uh, all of the buildings around it, the cathedral, as well as all the, um, the federal buildings, were built with the stones that, that of the Aztec temples, so. And with Indian labor. With Indian labor, and so there's also, it's obviously very symbolic. Um, that plaza is really, uh, it, it carries all of that weight. When people go there, it's not just because it's the center of power now, it's because it's, it's got all of that history behind it and it means something very, very deep to, to the people of Mexico, that plaza. So it's interesting, we're talking about, um, you know, kind of street activism, the role of public intellectuals, the response of, and um, you know, the book that Elena Poniatowska wrote, and if you don't know who she is, um, she's a, a Mexican, a Polish, I think her ancestry is Polish, I don't think she was born in Polish, she was born in, born in Mexico, creo. Elena mm -hmm. Poniatowska, who wrote a book called La Noche de Tlatelolco, which is all about the massacre that happened in 1968, and it was in the reading of that book that I decided to become a journalist, oh. because there were no, Latina Mexican journalists in the United States, but they existed in Mexico. And so I was like, oh, well, she, like, maybe yeah, I can awesome. do this. I'm not seeing it in the United States, but I'm seeing it in Mexico. Yeah. It means maybe I can be a, a, a journalist. But the whole notion of kind of activism and repression, um, social justice in the work that we do yeah. that has a relationship to what we may have experienced in Mexico. Sure. So, uh, well, so, so here's the thing, right now, if you're Mexican in the United States, if you're Latino in the United States, there's a particular kind of targeting that is being experienced. And can you guys talk a little bit about, so now you're, you're artists and writers who are creating here in the United States, you're not suffering the repression como en México, where it's dangerous right now to be a journalist, it's life-threatening. 
but you're here and something else is happening in terms of the conversation around Mexicans, uh, politics, uh, Latinos, the wall. Ruben? Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, so I'm a professor at Loyola Marymount University and I taught my last class on Tuesday night and um, the, our undocumented students, our DACA students, uh, DACA is the acronym for the Deferred Action uh, Children of Adult Arrivals, the Obama administration executive order that allowed undocumented students to study legally. So they're not really undocumented. They have some form of documentation now. Um, our students put up a wall on campus uh, that they spray it with cardboard, fo a faux wall, that they spray painted to look like you know steel. And they put uh, immigrant affirming uh, scripture Thou shalt not molest a stranger, you were one strangers in the land of Egypt, affirming, you know, uh, uh, the strangers in our midst. And vandals uh, spray painted on top of it the word Trump and deport all the illegals. This is at Loyola Marymount University, a progressive Jesuit campus that has social justice in its mission statement. It sent shockwaves to the community. Our undocumented students overnight organized in alliance with LGBT students, in alliance with the African American students, in alliance with all the uh, other vulnerable emerging communities. And uh, our little campus, our little Catholic university campus became a, a hotbed of stuff. At the same time, UC San Diego had incidents of hate. At the same time, the Pitzer College did. College campuses across the country have been trumped, essentially. Our students have been responding. They presented demands to the president about what could be done to confront this on our campus because now we know that that energy is not just outside the campus, it's on the campus, right? And the president responded positively to the demands and our students, our undocumented students, were at the very forefront of that struggle. So um, uh, I would say that uh, just like in 2006 when the undocumented uh, community turned out by the millions across the country and lost their fear and affirmed their identity in the face of authority, we have a generation of dreamers that have been doing that for several years now, and they're at the forefront right now of, the, of pushing back and resisting uh, this, this, this energy from, uh, from Donald Trump and his followers. So interestingly, I'm also a professor because I'm Mexican, which means I have 16 jobs. You can laugh. I'm also very proud of it. Um, I'm actually the, the Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz visiting scholar at DePaul yeah. University. Yeah. And one of the things that we did just on Thursday, yesterday when I taught my class, was to invite the head of the student group at DePaul, a Catholic university that also woke up to chalkings on the ground, on the, they, they wrote in chalk, we, you know, bravo Trump, but they wrote one that said build a wall. And so the students reacted to it, and so I said to the students, um, they pointed out to one woman who's uh, the head of Trump's on, the head of students for Trump on campus, and I said, let's invite her to the class. They said, no! I said, really? Teachable moment. I said, how about if we invite her to the class? And they said, okay. And she came yesterday. And so we had a conversation with the head of students for Trump on the campus with a majority of um, Latino students, all Latino students actually. Um, and that moment when she said, yes, I believe that every undocumented immigrant should be deported. And I said, you're saying that to children to children. You're saying that to young people in this room who have parents or grandparents or brothers and sisters. And she was kind of stumped at that moment. But it is, it's a way in which this is coming very close to us. It's so infuriating for me. I can, I, I can really barely talk about it. Um, and I, I mean, I think that the, 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 um, the aggression and the racism, um, it's, it's not just about uh, the undocumented, and, and the desire to build a wall isn't just about the undocumented, it's about y the three of us, it's about, it's about everyone. Um, I, I, it's very difficult for me to, to, to really even wrap my head around the, uh, the level of anger and hatred and, um, and uh, mental violence that, that is being just thrown so easily thrown around. And, and we know that, that when, when it's done so publicly, it, it may always be there under the surface. We've all, we've all 
been victim to that. We, we've all known since we were children that it was there under the surface. But when things get openly voiced, it's in such an easy way, in such, you know, just like spills out of the mouth like water. Um, it creates this tension and uh, allows for things to be said and done that uh, to me are just um, overwhelming. It's overwhelming to me actually to, to even talk about it. It is, it does get exhausting. Um, and it can take us to a really sad place. But for a second, I actually want to talk about that, about identity, which of course we also can't separate like, the again, the fact that um, we all care about issues around social justice, I think has everything to do with our, our sense of who we are and identity in relation to this country. Ruben, um, I, I find it very interesting. You Do you identify as mestizo? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> cool. Depending on the time of well, day. You know, <laughs> yeah. I just find that this is a term, as I've been, I don't know, for whatever reason, having to check off the forms yeah, yeah, yeah. of a number of things. And I'm just like, none of these really work. You know, sure. or I'm going to check them all, or I'm not going to check anyone. And, I, and I've been thinking a lot about mestizaje. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to define mestizaje sure. for the audience, and then talk about how does, is that what's working for you and, and you as well, Veronica, yeah. no yeah, sé si yeah. the term mestizaje, yeah. is, is it one that we should embrace or is there a sense of? Well, we're definitely mestizex up yeah, here. Yeah, I you think know? <laughs> mestizex. Mestizex. Um, but, uh, so I had cause a, a couple years ago to look up the etymology for the first time. All these years, you know, the, the word mestizo is like, uh, it's like, it's, it's like mother tongue to us because that's who we are. That's like our bedrock foundational identity as mixed race people from Latin America, right? But I never looked up the etymology of it until a few years ago that I was working on a documentary about the first century after the, after the conquest or contact um, between the, uh, Europe and the New World. And mestizo, I, I thought it might have been like a, a New World term, but it's not. It's from Spain. And it was used in Spain to refer to the mixing of animals. Claro. <laughs> so when I found that out, yeah. it's like, oh, it all makes sense. It's kind of part of the caste system. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, when the, the, the first contact between new and old worlds, the Spaniards, w and there was the birth of a new race. <laughs> um, but I'm bummed. The cosmic race. And so there was no language for this new mixed identity. You know, it's like, an alien, you know, lands on Earth and has a love affair and, you know, who's born? We're born. And there was no language for this in the Spanish language, so they picked the term out of, you know, uh, breeding of animals, a mixed, you know, uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, cows and mixing horses. That was what a mestizo, that's where mestizo came from. And so it clearly, it's laden with racial meaning. Well, it's insulting, actually. Yes, yes, and yet, over the centuries, my mother, Salvadoran poet, I'm my mother's son, you know, in her poems, she was constantly declaiming the pride of being the daughter of the conquered and the, conquer the conqueror and the conquered, and I am the daughter of mestiza blood. And, and she would invoke it with great pride, like, you know, every uh, 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 school child in Latin America does, you know, as, unless you're indigenous, and then you hear mestiza, well, wait a second, that's not me, you know. But so the, it's a complicated, it's a very complicated term. I mean, I'm definitely mixed, you know, but it's, it's hard to, you know, take mestizo and not uh, remember kind of like the echoes of that violence way back when, mm -hmm. which is still in our blood. Veronica. I say mestizexy. <laughs> no. I, I mean, I think it's the, it's the, um, it's the new world, you know, it's the Americas. Uh, every, that's, that's what it is. We experienced it differently in Latin America because Catholicism embraces um, embrace the indigenous people. Catholicism is about growing out and taking people in and making the Catholic tribe larger. Uh, it was very different from the pro Protestant sensibility, which is about I, and so you get rid of that which isn't you. Um, so for that reason, the indigenous culture is still so present, not only in us, but also in these in, in communities that haven't been uh, shoved completely to the side. You see, you see indigenous culture everywhere in Mexico. Um, my family is Irish, French, um, and, and indigenous, just, just like anywhere else in the Americas. Everyone, but it's been going on forever. I can't believe that um, 
It, it went on in Spain, right? I mean, the motion the of people, the Moors were in Spain. The motion of people has been going on forever. It's the history of, of, of the human race. It's the history of motion and uh, migration and flow and sharing of ideas and self and blood and all of it, all of it. We're all all of it. And yet, and yet it's um, in, the, in this country at this moment, and actually not even in this country, in the world, the notion of migration and people moving is causing so, so much fear, yeah. so much fear. And I'm kind of looking and saying, what is everybody so afraid of? Look at what's been created so far yeah. from all of this mestizaje, yeah. which actually is a term that I love. Of course, now I'm like, Híjole, you know, I'm not sure. But I do, <laughs> I do, I, I, I love it because mixed, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and I did think it was a word that was Nahuatl, so I'm like, okay. <laughs> Not you so, and me both. Not so much. Um, now, one of the things that, because we live in New York, um, you know, New York likes to think of itself as like the spot for cool culture and what's happening and avant-garde. And yet in my experience in Mexico City, actually, is that Mexico City is way light years ahead in terms of what's happening and cutting edge and avant-garde. Um, is that your perception of, of how you interact with Mexico City in terms of the arts. And I'm, I mean, you could talk about Merida as well, where, you know, you also have a connection, but. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, I think that uh, uh, Mexico, Mexico City in particular right now is so, so hot in terms of art. Um, it's really, uh, it's really exploding. And, and it's stuff that's been going on there for a long time, but it's, uh, you know, everything has become global, in, including art. And so we're seeing the motion of, of that in film, Mexican film, we all, you know, it's so celebrated now, and, and uh, fine art and, and literature. Um, I think it's, I think right now is a particular moment of explosion. And I think it comes from what we've been talking about is that this flow of ideas and the thing about Mexico and the, the uh, mestizaje in Mexico is that it's happening in the United States and I think it's making some people really scared, right? The browning of America. And we're like, yay, the browning of America. And there are other people who are like, oh, the browning of America. Um, but, but in Mexico, it's been brown for hundreds of years. And, and that, that, again, I'm really into this idea of flow and taking and giving and everyone influencing everyone else. And um, it happens in art. Uh, and and that, I think that's what makes the art in Mexico so great. And the film in Mexico is so great right now, really uh, exploding, really. When you go, do you, is that where, when you go to Mexico City, do you feel like you have enough time? Because I know we're always working, right? But Sure. So, like I, what I said earlier, half-jokingly, I'm from Los Angeles, the second largest Mexican city. Uh, like, LA's relationship to you all in New York, we la, la hate you. We la hate you. <laughs> you know? Uh, we're the Big Orange, we're the Big Apple, and uh, in the literary scene in Los Angeles, there was this constant, like, we're going to try to scale the huge Everest of New York to be published one day. You know, um, and uh, 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 an inferiority complex. Let's 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 be honest about it. It's New York is the literary capital of the world. Mexico City is the undeniable one of the great capitals of of Latin global Southern you know arts and culture, and certainly Latin American arts and culture. And so, coming from Los Angeles, where most people, most Mexicans in Los Angeles are not from Mexico City. They're from Jalisco and Zacatecas and Michoacan, right? So, and in Mexico City, I, I'm sorry, in Mexico. I would say most of the people who are not Mexico City la hate Mexico City. <laughs> it's true. Chilangos. Exactly. Chilangos. The Chilangos, that's the, 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 the slang term, derogatory First slang term. For, yeah. And Mexico. so, but it's also a site of absolute necessary pilgrimage for any Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex, to go down uh, and authenticate themselves by climbing the Pyramid of the Sun and going to the Via de Guadalupe and see where Our Lady Guadalupe was born. and. Uh, and I did that very early on and followed in the footsteps of my father who lived in Colonia Roma, it was around the corner from William Burroughs when the Beats were hanging out down there. And there's a great mystique about Mexico City too. And it's, it's, it's an inspiring place, it's a, a vibrant, energetic place. And it's also elitist and snobbish and you know, too hip for thou and you know, all kinds of things. You know, if, if you're not from the center, if you're looking at it from the margins, it can kind of like great, let's be honest. Um, any Chilangos here? Yes. 
Aquí, I'm totally aquí. dissing you all. Perdónanme. Que vienen los chilangos, come on. Um, the relationship of the South and the North is, um, is who we are, right? And I want to thank Veronica and Ruben for being on stage and talking about this. Um, we could stay on stage for a long time talking about this, you know, as you say, this kind of foggy, perpetual... I like to tell um, people who feel uncomfortable about it about living between two worlds is tranquilos, it's okay, you can live between two worlds, it's all right. It's all right to feel like you don't be belong there or belong here, like enjoy the fact that you're a person who can feel that you don't belong in two places. Like how cool is that? You get both. And you get both, yeah. but it's a whole kind of accepting and part of what happens also is that we don't see ourselves reflected, we don't see ourselves and so th we don't believe that we have legitimate stories, but then What's happening now is actually all of this legitimizing of our culture and our representation with authors and writers and multimedia artists like Ruben and Veronica, but also with um, musicians who are creating like amazing things and you're gonna get a chance to hear them. We're gonna take a little intermission and then we're gonna come back with Harana Beat, who is a Brooklyn-based award-winning band. I can't wait to see them, so no se vayan. Quédense con nosotros. <laughs> and um, we'll see you in a minute. A round of applause, please, for Veronica Andrew. Gracias, Maria.